Good morning and welcome to the 2014 Enterprise Toronto Small Business Forum. My name is Michelle Harvey and I'm the Associate Vice President for Small Business Banking for TD. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker. In 2005, at the age of 23, this native of Winnipeg opened the first Freshie location in Toronto. Today there are over 150 locations in 60 cities and 10 countries and Freshie continues to grow at an impressive pace. If you've ever had the Bangkok Prito, you'll know why, but my current favorite is the Warrior Bowl. Last year, the same individual launched Fresh Startups, a technology accelerator. The mission of Fresh Startups is to invest in young technology companies that share a commitment to helping people live longer, healthier lives. Our first keynote speaker is the recipient of a number of awards, including the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, Canada's Top 40 Under 40, and Inc. Magazine's Top 30 Under 30. He has appeared at Undercover Boss, and has been featured in Fortune Magazine, Bloomberg Television, and CNN. He is a member of the Young Presidents Organization and a board member of Invest Toronto. He currently lives in Chicago and Toronto with his wife, two daughters, and his dog. With two young children and 300 plus restaurants under development, we are fortunate that he could find the time to join us this morning. Please welcome Matthew Corrin, founder and CEO of Freshy and Fresh Startups. Thank you for the You're welcome. I would also like to introduce our moderator. She is the editor of Star Business Club, Toronto, the Toronto Star's hub for small businesses, news and networking. In the newspaper and on starbusinessclub.ca, she publishes tips, features and news on the startup and entrepreneurial scene in the GTA. She has reported for Maclean's Magazine, as well as produced and reported news for the CBC and the BBC. She has contributed articles to the Edmonton Journal, Toronto Star, and Globe and Mail. Please welcome Rosemary Westwood. Thank you. Thank okay. you for the warm welcome. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. You know how many free salads I had to hand out for that uh, introduction? <laughs> All right. So it's my pleasure, of course, to be here with Matthew this morning. Um, and I think a good place to start is at the beginning. Uh, Matthew is an unlikely restaurateur, uh, maybe even an unlikely entrepreneur. Matthew, you don't have a business degree. You have a background in PR in the fashion industry. You never worked in the restaurant industry. You never wrote a business plan. Uh, and once you launched, I think this is right, you were robbed three times in the first six weeks and your kitchen manager cut off his finger. So <laughs> how did you at all start Freshy and, and get to where you are today? You missed the fact that I was actually robbed three times by employees. By employees. Um, by employees. Which just adds insult to injury, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it, that is true. Uh, the first day we opened was the first day I ever worked in the restaurant business. Um, and, and before I realized how tough the restaurant business actually uh, is, I was, I was elbow deep in lettuce. Um, and, and besides being robbed and besides my kitchen manager slicing most of his thumb off, um, we had, a, we had a very challenging food review in one of the local newspapers. Um, we, had a, um, we had a hard time making payroll. Um, the month after that, it got worse, and the month after that, it got even worse. And, and so I think I did what any you know, naive young entrepreneur would do. I opened a second location. <laughs> and, and, and quite frankly, two locations grew into four, grew into uh, what's now uh, about 160 restaurants in 10 countries. Uh, we're opening two stores a week. We'll open uh, about 130 restaurants next year. Uh, so it's certainly been an interesting and, and wild ride. And when you started then, you, you didn't have all these things that maybe everyone thinks they need to have in order to start a business. So what did you start with? How, in the face of um, employee fraud and in the face of a bad review, did you, did you keep going? What were you holding on to? The thing about the restaurant business, uh, like probably most businesses, is it's not rocket science. Uh, it, it's just hard work, and so, so one of my one of my philosophies is is 
while I have no doubt that there's people in this audience that work as hard as me, there's nobody here that works harder than me. And so I refuse to fail from a lack of hard work. Uh, I, I said that as long as I work harder than anybody else in the, in the food court, I should be able to make this first location work. Um, and, and that continues to you know, very much be my, my mantra to date. And so in, in, aside from a business plan, then I know you have some pretty strong philosophic principles that uh, I think you called them the guiding principles. And these are a foundation where for some maybe a business plan would be. Talk about those. What are the, the core <coughs> values that Freshy holds to that you think have helped lead to this kind of enormous growth and success? So, so, um, I, so I didn't write a business plan. I, uh, in fact, I... I, not only did I struggle with my business uh, classes at, uh, at University of Western Ontario, but uh, I think I failed one of them. And my mom doesn't like me to say that publicly. I, I barely passed, I think I'll say. Um, but, uh, but in lieu of a business plan, um, and, and I got lucky because I was able to convince uh, a, a naive nurse and dentist, uh, uh, also known as my parents, to actually give me enough money for the first location. And, um, and so I didn't need a business plan to actually raise money for store one. Um, but what I wrote were, were guiding principles that uh, today very much uh, are part of our culture and my, my corporate team can list them off by memory and, and as can our franchise partners. Uh, and they're very simply, um, talk is cheap, execution sets you apart. Build a company with a killer culture, not a culture that kills your company. Um, Launch fast, fail fast, iterate even faster. Numbers rule with big exclamation marks. Uh, and, and finally, pick your battles. Um, and and in, you know, especially as a young entrepreneur, uh, you need to know when you should fight back and you need to know when you need to you know, roll over and, 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 and pick that battle. Um, talk about some of those then. I know corporate culture is um, a big one for you. I've been to the Freshie um, headquarters here in Toronto, and um, they're, they're a unique workspace, I would say. Uh, and it's also the truth that uh, Matthew is heading up a team of mostly his peers. So I'm really interested in that corporate culture. When you've been building your um, stores originally, and then you've been building your franchise partners, what have you been looking for in your employees and in your partners? What what are the core, I guess, um, values your Freshie uh, employees have? What's amazing is we have, uh, first of all, it, it's very sad to say that I'm now one of the oldest people in the company at, at 33, which, is, uh, which I think says a lot. Um, almost none of the members on our senior team come from the restaurant business. Uh, however, most of them do come from the, uh, with business degrees now. So even though I didn't come from one, it's nice to surround myself with people who understand uh, how to build financial models. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but what's interesting is our, our franchise base is we have everything from, uh, from you know, new immigrants to the country uh, who started as, as hourly employees at Freshie uh, and worked their way up and now literally own their, their one, first store and are building their second store, uh, all the way to um, ex-MBA players in Houston. We've got a, uh, an Olympic bobsled gold medalists in, uh, out in PEI. Um, we've got the commissioner of one of the four big sports leagues uh, as a franchisee in the States. And so it's really this very broad, broad uh, network of franchise partners uh, sharing a very common goal, which is they're all passionate about entrepreneurship and they're all passionate about health and wellness. And, and those two themes, uh, plus, plus picking the partners that have that, that you know, I will always be the hardest worker in the room mentality uh, has been a really great formula for, for success for us. And so that's a key part of, of what Freshie is doing. If you can talk about sort of your vision for the restaurant when you started out um, and what you think um, you're pushing for. I know you have Starbucks type goals uh, in mind. So what, what is it that Freshie is, is all about? What are everyone sort of buying into on that level? Well, what, it's interesting what's happening in the, uh, in the restaurant industry, in the, re in the restaurant arena right now. Uh, and if you're, you know, as, as customers of, the, the interesting thing is all of us in this room, you know, good economy, bad economy, we all have to eat. So we all probably eat at restaurants uh, at least a couple of days a week and some of us probably more. Um, 
But what's happening in the in restaurant industry right now are the big fast food giants, McDonald's, um, Burger King, Wendy's, they actually have, are having some of the, uh, the hardest times in the history of their businesses. They're, they're having their slowest quarters of growth, uh, their lowest profits in history. They're, they're losing customer traffic to this very new, uh, new generation of, of a new sector within the industry called fast casual, which, which is a new industry um, that represents better quality ingredients in a better designed store with a better store vibe, better music, with an employee base that they interact with in real time as opposed to just punching buttons. Uh, and so Freshie and, and peers like Freshie are actually, are actually taking customer share, market share away from these fast food giants, uh, because, largely because the millennials, which is obviously a big part of our customer base, are, are demanding better ingredients to know where they were, when they came from and you know, what farm, uh, as opposed to the fried food and, and just cheap, right? And so, um, so our value proposition is not necessarily that we're the cheapest food in, in the street, but it's uh, it, we're authentic. And, and that's really resonating with, uh, with the millennial generation, which is obviously a growing base of our, of our customers. I think it's important to point out, in, a, in addition to that, um, though, that you have stores in some unlikely places, I, I would call them, or unusual places. And it, that speaks to something, you know, a, a customership that's far beyond um, maybe what people think of when they think of a millennial. So talk about the Freshie branding and, and who you're trying to reach. I think it's quite a, a, broad, a broad spectrum of, of our, our culture. Well, say. it's quite interesting because when, when, I, when I started Freshie, uh, just, just to sort of think about the context, in 2005, we were awarded the most innovative retail concept of the year across Canada. Uh, in fact, I was given a check for $50,000 for this award, in which we then used to open more stores. But, uh, but the fact that serving you know, fresh ingredients in a, in a food court with nice takeout packaging was considered the most innovative thing to happen in 2005 is quite, quite staggering, right? And we've come a long way. Uh, and, and in fact, I travel four days a week every week. And, and I can tell you, in every city I visit, the longest lines uh, around lunchtime are coming from places that are, are Hopefully it's Freshie, but if it's not Freshie, it's somebody like Freshie. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that says a lot. We've come a long way. But, um, but there's clearly more awareness around uh, healthy eating. You know, obesity is, is an epidemic. It's a global epidemic. Childhood diabetes in Dubai is the highest anywhere in the world. Uh, and that's the reason why our Dubai stores are some of our most profitable stores in our company. Um, but we've built 12 stores in Colombia, South America. Uh, we've got half a dozen stores in Stockholm, Sweden, 20 stores in Chicago. And so we've really entered multiple markets and proved that, that there is a demand for, for healthy, affordable, convenient food. Um, and, our, and our mission for the brand is, is probably not so different from what Starbucks' mission is, which is we want to be a utility brand. We, we don't want to be the, you know, a, a flash in the pan. We don't want to be the next hot thing or, the, or a fad or a trend. We want to be this utility that one day everybody just says, you know, like they use Starbucks or Tim's for their morning coffee. It's like, oh yeah, I use Freshie for my, to fuel, you know, to, to give me fuel through the day, whether it's for breakfast or lunch or snack or dinner. And that's really our mission. And we want to be known as a utility brand. And when people describe us, when we ask our customers, just describe Freshie in words, we just want to, we want the response to be, well, it's just Freshie. It's just that place I go, I can trust that it's, you know, going to give me fuel and energy. Um, let's go back then and, and talk about how all this growth sort of came to be from a financial perspective. You mentioned that you had um, uh, some cash from the bank of mom and dad uh, to the tune of $250,000, I think, to help you start at the beginning. How have you capitalized this expansion? Um, and I know, in, in fact, you've had some struggles earlier on when you went to Chicago right around the time of the financial crisis, which would have been interesting. So, so talk about how you finance this, this growth. Uh, Richard Branson, in, his, in one of his autobiographies, wrote a really interesting quote, which I'll never forget, which is, in business, the line between success and failure is very thin, and those companies who are undercapitalized often find themselves on the wrong side of that line. Uh, and and I'm, I'm living proof that you can be undercapitalized and not go to the wrong side of the line, although there's many, many years uh, that we probably should have gone out of business and didn't. Um, but I think it's, you know, we have a refuse to fail uh, attitude. And, um, and, and I think uh, just sort of a, a very sort of steady state of patience, knowing that 
we're going to get through really tough times. You know, our, some, of our, some of our fastest growth and our biggest years of growth came during the recession, um, where, where really sort of great, uh, great um, fortune company executives were being laid off and being given a, uh, a severance check and coming out with an attitude saying, I'll never, I'll never work for the man again. Uh, and, and started to look and see what, what else is out there. And, and suddenly we started to pair, find ourselves pairing with, with laid off executives who were given a great, you know, great uh, check to reinvest uh, and, and an entrepreneurial spirit at that. So, so that's sort of an interesting perspective as well. And, and that's really how we've, we fuel our growth um, by, by you know, having literally now uh, almost 200 small business owners, entrepreneurs uh, in 10 countries who are you know, trying to live the Canadian dream or the American dream or the Colombian dream. Um, and, and that's something that we're incredibly proud of, obviously. I think uh, in the beginning as well, before maybe you moved to the franchise model, it was um, uh, an expansion mode that you, that you financed through creative cash flow management <laughs> or it's, I, something I'll, like that. I'll, I'll say this, and not just because they're a sponsor, but TD Bank has been our banking partner for, uh, for a decade. And, uh, and TD Bank actually gave us uh, our first three Canadian small business loans to help us open stores uh, two, three, and four. Um, and you were, you were playing them, I think, playing them is maybe a strong word, but you were going to all of the banks. You, were, you, weren't, you weren't picking one partner to start. I think um, you've told me that you went to every single major bank looking for a small business loan and told them that that was your strategy and you were looking for the bank that was going to... Yeah, it didn't, it didn't hurt that our first store was in the TD Center. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that was, in fact, one of my, that was my final sales pitch to TD. Like, wouldn't it be embarrassing if BMO financed our, <laughs> our location in the TD Center? Uh, and I'm like, we have the same color logo. Like, this yeah, is so obvious. Yeah, look at green there's, up here. I think this so is There's so many really reasons well why this organized. partnership makes sense. And, yeah. Uh, and so, yes, they were played. I mean, it was great. It was, it's been a great partnership. Yeah, excellent. Um, so talk about um, some of the um, markets that have been unlikely successes for you. Um, when you think about um, some of the places you've gone, where were stores open that you weren't quite sure? And, and what do you think led to the success that happened there? One of the things that's, yeah, and I, I think I've sort of touched on it, but it's so encouraging that markets like Peterborough, Ontario, and Regina, Saskatchewan um, have, been, have been really strong markets for us in Canada. Uh, small markets like Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, have been really strong markets. In fact, so so after these nine stores in Toronto, I, I moved my. Uh, I, uh, it was it was mentioned. I moved my my wife and dog and unborn child to Chicago, uh, to prove that freshy, healthy eating would work in a steak and potatoes town, and and I knew you know I knew it was obvious that it would play on both coasts, the east and the west coast, uh, but to to. To work in a market where you know the Midwest likes their steak, if I could convince them to actually you know choose uh, choose veggies uh, several days a week instead of steak, I think it, I, I knew it would be okay, and we'd be building a business model that truly had scale. I think if we didn't choose Chicago second, I'm not convinced that we would have actually built something that resonated with Peterborough or Grand Rapids or Regina. Um, so that's been really really nice. You were warned against that move as well. That was something that, I don't know if you can hear me, he was warned against going to the United States. Um, you, you were told that Canadian, this I think is something that we hear all the time, Canadian companies somehow are, are not um, going to be successful in the United States or something innate or, or oh, not I think it's, the same. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a statistic, st statistical fact that uh, most Canadian companies fail in the United States. Um, and there's a, there's a huge list. Uh, and I'll save, you know, I'll save them the, the, uh, the marketing plug by, by mentioning them on stage. But, but somebody actually handed me a book. Uh, I think that the, the title of the book was Why Canadian Com Brands Fail in the U.S. Um, what, what, we're, what we're pretty focused on doing, and, I'm, and I, uh, you know, it, it's something that I, uh, um, I refuse to not let happen, is we're going to build a billion-dollar business, a uh, global retail brand, from Toronto, um, and I'm not sure there's there's a handful. I'm not sure there's even one retail brand um, globally that's that's based in Toronto. Uh, certainly not one that I can think of. Um, 
if, if there is one, feel free to raise your hand and mention it. Um, but but what, what is interesting is, is not Starbucks, not McDonald's, and not Subway open their first 100 locations faster than Freshie. Uh, and I think that says a lot. I think that says a lot of how the Toronto community, I mean, everything we do starts in Toronto. It starts in our test kitchen, starts in our headquarters. And so Toronto as a group is actually helping us craft uh, what ultimately gets sent out to the masses uh, around the world. And I, I think that's actually really interesting. And I think, I think it, it goes back to uh, this sort of cultural uh, melting pot that we live in, in this city. Uh, that's, that's really resonated and we're, we're certainly um, targeting many cultures so that when we take it to uh, you know, other places in the world, it actually resonates as well. Um, and, and what about sort of over the course of all this, just sort of the last question about, I guess, motivation. Um, what are some of the lowest moments you've had since 2005 and how have you overcome those? I mean, I don't, I don't really spend time thinking about low moments. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can, I could probably think of a low moment last week and the week before that, but I'm not sure there's, there's certain things that stand out. I mean, I would say that, that one guiding principle of numbers rule, probably the worst feeling in the world is, uh, at least in business, I should say, is, is finishing a month end and receiving your financial results from your bookkeeper and being just shocked by the results. And by the way, like pleasant surprises aren't okay either. Um, and I remember, I'll never forget being in Chicago uh, on a Friday night and receiving my month end results and just being really surprised at how far we had missed uh, and how much that actually impacted a full year. It's one twelfth of the year and it really, it really impacted. Uh, and so there's moments like, certain moments in the life cycle that I'll never forget. Uh, you know, maybe that was a low moment. Um, but, but from that moment, I refuse to ever allow numbers to surprise me. Um, there's, a, there's a mantra in, in business uh, that if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, and, and so every week we try to add one or two different measures to our business that we can then share with our franchise system um, so that they can better manage their, their business. How many were, did you open before you moved to the franchise model? The first, the first 10 restaurants we opened, uh, okay. nine in Toronto and one in Chicago okay. were company owned. And, and I did literally manage the first restaurant. Um, I remember the first day I called my mom, uh, my investor, and I'm like, yes, mom, you won't believe it. We did, we did $2,200 in sales today. And she said, is that good? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, and, and it's true, I didn't have any, all I, here's all I did know. I know for six months straight, uh, and I'll never forget this, but for six months straight, we broke sales records for literally six months in a row and we tapped out at uh, almost three times that opening day number. Um, uh, and so, and that was because I think I was working the restaurant and, and you know, when, when two employees didn't show up. I mean, what's crazy is that the people that stole from me, I even, at some points I had to keep them on because it was, it was more expensive for me to fire them than for them to steal from me. Think of that. Like That's I needed crazy. them to help us run the lunch rush. Um, uh, it would have been, you know, so I, would, I, was, I was accepting theft over, over uh, sales, which is insane. That is insane. So that it's, at some point you step away from, from these managerial roles and you decide to, to franchise this endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and talk about that and then, and then more about kind of how your role has changed since then. Like what is your day like? What are you doing? How do you manage your time? Um, I know you're... Um, here from a red eye flight from Vancouver, for example, and that is really the norm for you instead of an exception. So, yeah, so talk about that. Histor I mean, historically, I, I travel um, about 150,000 miles a year. Uh, one of the things you don't realize is if you're if you have any desire to build a a global retail brand, it means you're going to be traveling a lot, or you're probably going to fail. Uh, so, you know, my 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 desire to succeed in the U.S was only because I moved to the US and said, I'm never gonna get into whatever these bad habits that people claim Canadian brands have when they enter, I will not, I will not accept that. So I'm gonna live there and understand it. Uh, and inevitably that meant I was gonna go spend too much time in Dubai and too much time in you know, uh, Bogota, Colombia to, to, to really understand the cultural nuances. Really today my job is to pick franchise, pick the right franchise partners uh, we've, we've built a business model 
um, that, that I'm incredibly proud of that works. If you follow, you know, if you follow our yellow brick road, we will, we will make you money. If you go off your own path, you're on your own. But if you follow our line, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that we can, we'll, we'll deliver a very, uh, very satisfied return on investment um, and, and business model to execute with. Um, so really where I spend my time now is making sure we pick good partners because we've, we've, hired, we've picked plenty of bad partners um, and, uh, and that's pretty painful. You, you, only have so many, you only have so many energy pellets in your pocket each day to use and it's a disservice to, to the brand to spend them on negative and, 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 and poorly operating partners. Uh, when you're doing that, you're actually not helping or pushing the brand forward at all. Are you saying that you've had to um, divorce some we've had, partners? We've well, had, yes, yes. We've had, we've, we've had to close stores in the past. We've had to, uh, we've had to part ways. Uh, we've had to uh, enter the courtroom. Uh, mm. and all, all exciting things. There was a brief period where litigation was like a, a happy word for me. It was just like this part <laughs> of doing business. Um, but, but, you know, uh, it, that's why all those, all those inefficient uh, parts of business that, that, that don't, you know, that stall growth, don't accelerate growth, uh, are reasons why now I'm very close and really take the lead on picking the right partner for our, our brand. Um, Let's talk about the start of that then. Um, at what point were you, were you convinced that franchising was the way to go? How did you make that decision? And what did you say to yourself you were looking for in someone? Well, I, so when I started, and the reason, the reason the first 10 stores we opened were company owned is I actually thought franchising was a dirty word. I did not like, I didn't like what franchising, what I thought franchising represented. Which is uh, what? I, so I thought it was um, taking advantage of a small business owner, uh, making them work 100 hours a week uh, and barely squeaking by it with a profit. And, and I didn't, I actually like, I just, that's, that was my interpretation of, of franchising while, while corporate got rich. And I never wanted to, I never wanted to do that. But, but as I said, as we started to really understand who were the types of partners that were genuinely interested in our brand, by the way, we've never, we've never once ever advertised franchise sales or development. And we receive over 100 applications every week through our website. Um, when, when Undercover Boss ran, we received like 1,000. Uh, um, and so just as you think about, um, I'm sure. This is the show. Maybe we should explain Undercover Boss. Undercover Boss, the TV show uh, where, I, where I went undercover um, to learn about the restaurants, basically. And, uh, your restaurants. You went undercover to, at your to own. To learn about my restaurants, freshies. yeah. You, you don't think people in the audience have seen Undercover Boss? I don't know. Some, there might be a few. Can you just raise your hand if you, if you don't know Undercover Boss? Okay, I'm seeing okay, some good. hands. Thank Everybody you. knows Undercover Boss. 98% of the people. In fact, Agreed. statistically, we will, sell, um, we will sell four franchises from, from this audience. Statistic, hmm. Just statistically. And I, and I, I think I see the are. ones in the audience right now who are going <laughs> to. Uh, and if you sign up today, I'm going to give you a 50% yeah, right, discount. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, back to the decision. So, so, uh, so at, at some point, I don't know if you were getting offers, but you decided you wanted to franchise. What was that, what happened that that was the decision you made? You, you changed your mind that it was a dirty word and it became your business model. Well, as we, as we looked at who were actually showing interest in the brand, I realized that they were people that I was, they, they were the people that I wanted to go and have, you know, sushi and a, and a beer with on a Friday night. Uh, they were people who I wanted to hang out with. They were people who I thought could add value. Interestingly enough, the, um, the Egg McMuffin, the Subway $5 footlong, the Happy Meal are all franchisee-created initiatives hmm. within Subway and McDonald's, respectfully. Um, and, and so when I realized that you can actually collaborate and, and add a tremendous amount of value, by bringing in you know, multiple partners and dividing and conquering, that's something that inspired us. And, and I can tell you, um, uh, this green juice and, uh, and kale and, oh, um, is, yeah. and quinoa are all, are all menu items that were introduced through franchise partners where I said, there's no way somebody's gonna pay you know, $7 for this kale, uh, kale you know, fresh pressed juice. Um, and, and sure enough, you know, we, sell, we sell plenty of them. So, so that's really, the, that's, the, that's the side of franchising that, 
that made me realize that uh, if we can grow faster through franchising, which is, which is one of the, the benefits of franchising, you, you get, over time, you get hundreds and thousands of partners dividing and conquering all at once. So if you can, if you can get that concept going, plus you can get really smart innovation, uh, you can actually continue to um, accelerate growth. And, and that's, probably why, that's probably why we've had so much, you know, rel on a relative basis, so much uh, growth in the early days of our, of our life cycle. That puts you in an interesting leadership position. We're having a lot of leadership discussions, obviously, in the city um, and making a big decision, all of us, of course, on Monday. Um, and I'm really curious about that, about how your leadership um, philosophy has, has grown and, and changed and maybe how you see you know, key things that a, a strong leader should have. Well, I mean, I think, um, so here, here's something interesting. I, I, um, so I started this when I was 23. I did a three-year BA and moved straight to New York City and, and did one job. I only had one full-time job um, before, uh, before founding Freshie. Uh, and that was for an iconic fashion designer named Oscar De La Renta. Um, and some of you may, might know that Oscar passed away earlier this week. Um, and I was reflecting on his life and, and then his death. And, and I realized that as a young entrepreneur, you don't know what you don't know. And, and you, take, you have very few experiences to pull from. And one of the places you pull from is prior work experience. And I only had one of those. And, and I realized that many of my management traits today are, are things that I directly learned from Oscar himself. Uh, to lead by example, to be in the trenches, um, to always do with an eye on style. Uh, and so while he may no longer be with us, uh, I have no doubt his management style lives on. Uh, I mean, that I know for certain. So, so it, it is interesting. It, it's really looking at, at uh, brands and, and, and CEOs that I admire most and really trying to understand what makes them tick and how I can take those learnings uh, into our own brand. So for your own staff then, um, I think this, this will feed a bit into the corporate culture question we kind of started a bit earlier, but um, what are, what are you um, sort of offering them or, or how are you leading them and giving them these, these opportunities to, to be successful for themselves and for the company aside from maybe having somewhat of a gym uh, in the office, you guys? I know. We have, have yeah. I mean, physical exercise is a big part of, of the motivation in, in your team, I know. You, you, I think you'd have to ask them. We have, we have a couple of things. We have very little turnover. We have several members of our, of our corporate team that actually started off uh, as, as working employees in the stores. Um, in fact, every employee that gets hired has to spend a month going through the full franchise training program. So, you know, so everybody comes out certified to be a, a franchise operator and owner. Um, which gives them some authority in our business. Um, we, do, we do weekly group runs, just to give you sort of culturally, we do weekly group runs. Um, they get free food as long as it's freshy. <laughs> uh, um, there's something else really good that we do. Oh, I like you know, your chin you know up else bar, we do? but that was just... We have, a, we have an unlimited vacation policy. So th there's no two weeks or one week or three weeks a year. Uh, you literally can take as many days off as you want um, and, are those and are those all those all sound really great? I would love to to have that as part of my job. Are those motivating factors? What are the motivating um, you know things that you do with your team to that would make them sort of push hard for you, or or are those part of that? I mean, I think you know, I think um, I think we 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 have a very sort of like-minded group of of. I, th I think it's really fun. Like we everything everything that. The, the chaos that ensues every day at work uh, is self-created. I mean, we you know we create we created that chaos, right? We decided that we wanted to uh, to roll out an extra menu item or, or enter another country or uh, you know be part of a TV show. And, and so when you make those decisions, and you have to be prepared for the uh, ensuing chaos that will or the the chaos that will ensue. So. Um, so I think, you know, I think we, we have just a really good work ethic attitude. We have, most of us actually don't have chairs. We stand. So, so we don't feel like we're sort of sitting in an office all day. Um, um, we constantly have franchise partners coming through our store for training. We, we're, training we're training three groups right now, from uh, a group from Fort McMurray, um, uh, Alberta, a group from um, uh, 
uh, Stockholm and, um, and a group from out east um, in PEI are all training right now uh, to go back and open their respective stores later this year. So. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of um, ambition in the people you hire. It sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for people to um, affect change inside the company. Um, I think going back to one of the guiding principles, you say um, iterate. What is it? Iterate yeah, it's fast. Launch fast. Launch fast. Fail fast. Iterate yeah. faster. Yeah. Is that's a. I mean, that's like a technology. If anybody's in tech startups, that's very much a technology mantra, which is uh, to be. It's called A/B testing, where you push out to uh, you know to users through the internet like two different scenarios, and you watch to see which one has the best results or the desired results, and that's that's the one you end up going with. And so we have we have a, this test kitchen in uh, in our in our corporate headquarters where it's an actual store where actual customers come in and, and spend their money every day, but we we test everything through there. So just to give you a I'll give you a real life example. We just launched chili. Uh, it will be a, our fall menu item. Uh, a vegan chili, and we've got an aged a cha steak and aged cheddar, and a sriracha chicken chili. Yeah. And and over the course of the last two months, it was only tested at one store, where we were testing pricing, portion sizes, placement within the store, upselling versus just letting the customer find it. Um, and so we do all these tests, and then we 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 send it around to the network. So there's a lot of uh, it's a dynamic place. It sounds like. Maybe that's well, a big part I'm, of I'm biased. That. I mean, yeah, yes, I think it is, but I'm, I'm biased. Um, let's, let's look at um, kind of your role um, a bit bigger in terms of entrepreneurship. You're, you work with the city of Toronto. You have your own accelerator. Talk about some of the things outside of Freshie that, that are part of your passion for entrepreneurship. Um, so one of the things, what's, in, really, what's really interesting is, is uh, for for young, for I think for anybody, for any entrepreneur, uh, bricks and mortar is actually a pretty expensive venture. Like building a bricks and mortar retail shop costs money, right? Like you have to pay for bricks and mortar, and um, and so it's it's actually more cost effective to launch a tech company, and that's why m my generation's largely you know stayed away from traditional business and now gone into this new way of technology. Um, and then inevitably, all these new tech startups, uh, literally every, you know, every day we're getting another group who thinks they built the next best piece of technology for our business, whether it's for our customers or for our, our franchise partners or for our corporate team to make us more efficient. And, uh, and increasingly, we were just being um, inefficient with our amount of energy that we were you know, vetting, vetting these tech startups. And so we said, well, if we're going to allocate a team member to vet them and all this energy to look at them every day, we should actually own a piece of, of them and actually help them navigate uh, the tech that they're building for something that could ultimately much, be much bigger than our business. So we launched uh, Fresh Startups, which is an accelerator that invests in uh, brands, technology companies that share our mission, which is it has to help their user live healthier, longer lives. And, uh, and we've made a handful of investments to date, um, uh, and, it's been a, and it's been a great way uh, for us to get be close to technology. Uh, it allows me to share a passion of you know with with young entrepreneurs, helping them navigate the early days of business. Um, and then and then the flyer is you know if something if one of these companies really take off and become a global phenomenon. Uh, um, you're in on the ground floor. Then, then we own, you know, then we own 10% of the company. Yeah. Um, and how, how important is? I mean, you said it a little bit, but how important is technology then? Do you think to the the ongoing success of of Freshie? Is it is it really that uh, big a deal that you have an app or however people might use technology to engage with the the brand and the product? Yeah, I mean, so on my phone, there's there's two parts. There's the there's technology for the customer. So by the end of the year, you'll be able to order on your phone. Um, and, and if our mission, our mission is to make healthy eating uh, more affordable and more convenient. So if you can order on your phone instead of walking and standing yeah. in line, that's making it more convenient. So from a customer base. But then also on my phone is a app that allows me to track our sales, our labor, our food costs, our average check, our customer account in real time. I can tell you exactly how many chilies we've sold across the system uh, <laughs> right now if I wanted to. Um, I'm tempted don't to ask, ask you to. I turn, I turn, <laughs> Has it looked? I turn my, I turn my wireless okay. off. Okay. Um, 
but um, and then we also have we have an app that we have cameras into all of our stores. So so the other side is um, helping our operators, our franchise operators, really be in tune with their business, helping them measure their business so they can manage their business. Uh, what's what's amazing is when when Subway and McDonald's were not so long ago, a decade ago, there was no there was none of this technology for the operators. Literally at the end of the day, uh, somebody would have to call, they'd have to call a hotline number and read off the ticket from their cash register of how many sales they had for the day and how many Big Macs they sold and how many small fries they sold. I mean, that's, that's only 10 years ago, right? Yeah. So it's, I, I always wonder how would we have fared in a decade earlier where, where there was way less technology? Would we have been ahead of the game? Would we have been behind the game for our brand and yeah. our team and our culture and dynamic? And what about 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, or 30 years from now? What are the, the big sort of long-term goals and, and visions you have? Does anybody know how many subways there are in the world, subway restaurants? Um, raise your hand if you think there's more than, more than 5,000. Raise your hand if you think there's more than uh, 15,000. Raise your hand if you think there's more than 40,000. So there's about 45,000. There's about 45,000 subways in the world, uh, and there's not 200 freshies yet. Um, and and I would argue that what what Subway represented in 1968, when Fred DeLuca, uh, who still who still owns Subway today, uh, opened the first Subway, um, he was a healthier solution to the traditional fast food. He was a healthy solution, a fresh alternative to fried food, right? Burgers and fries and, and soda. And I think what Freshy represents today is a healthier solution to, um, to a different way of eating. And so I think the, similar, the parallels are interesting. I definitely think trends are on our side. Um, I definitely can see that entrepreneurship has never been greater. I mean, this turnout is testament to that fact. Yeah. Um, shows like Dragon's Den and Kickstarter and Shark Tank, um, they've, they've never been more successful. Um, and so, and so I, actually, I actually believe, uh, and of course I just have these wild pipe dreams, but I believe that we're going to have tens of thousands of locations uh, over time, and, and I certainly could see myself owning this for the rest of my life. So you're not going to cash out at any point, because you still own, you still own. A hundred percent of my net worth is in this company, um, and, and I've been offered to sell that net worth uh, on several occasions, but, but you know, if you go and spend, if you spend $200,000 building a new app, then you want to see the return on that investment. And so, um, so you have to temper a right time to have a look, an exit with, uh, with how much bigger can it be. And I, and I believe, I certainly believe the best is yet to come. And I think trends suggest that um, the fact that we'll open about 120 restaurants next year alone um, suggests that. So, so I'm, having a, I'm having a lot of fun. Okay. There's nothing I'd want to do other. With the increasing trend towards uh, uh, viewers spending their, their time watching online versus uh, getting traditional cable subscriptions. Um, CBC has launched a, a spin-off show uh, called Dragon's Den uh, The Next Gen. Um, and, and I'll be one of the, one of the uh, dragons, uh, and it's going to be an online show uh, uh, focused around uh, Canadian entrepreneurs with great business ideas. Uh, and so it's timely because uh, we, we opened up auditions last night. Uh, and you can go to the link um, on the CBC and, and apply. And if anybody has a business idea uh, that you, you think would be uh, worthy of, um, of the Dragon's Den, now there's two shows to pitch on. Uh, uh, and I'll be biased because uh, I'm going to be on one of them. But uh, would love to get anybody who's interested to certainly sign up. That sounds like a great opportunity for many people here. I think we have some time for questions. Um, so maybe you can leave your business pitch to if you do want to um, apply for the Dragon's Den show and, and have questions. Uh, if you have questions now, you can stand up. I think there's a mic there I can see. There's one there, and there's a gentleman. Maybe uh, introduce yourself and then go ahead and ask Matthew your question. Um, hi, my name is Harley Goldlist. Uh, I've got a, a lot of experience. I'm a chartered accountant, I'm a business advisor, and I'm just starting a brokerage uh, to help people buy and sell businesses. But I want to say that Freshie is great. I love it. I'm very often. And because I'm a managing consultant, I'll say, take it right to the top. I would like if you would make smaller quant, um, sizes 
because I love your soup, but I just can't finish all of it in one time. <laughs> what am I going to do with it? <laughs> okay. And um, the question I have is, uh, when you interview different Maybe, people, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you and ask you to speak right into the sure. mic there so we can hear okay. you. Thanks. When you have prospective franchisees from so many diverse backgrounds, how can you tell in advance through your experience now whether they'll be franchi good franchisees or not? I mean, they could be football players, they could be ex-MBAs, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, how do you find that? It's such a great question, and I, I was having this conversation as recently as uh, this morning. We don't, there's, there's not a specific, you know, age or gender or, or ethnic background or net worth that defines what's a good and will be a make successful and, and, and uh, failed franchise partner. But, but we're getting better. So our criteria is simply, uh, one, you need to live in the city you're developing. So we don't want, we don't want absentee franchise owners. Uh, we want them to be, you know, within, within a half hour of their store. Uh, uh, two, they need to be passionate about health and wellness. So we, have, we ask a lot of questions to understand whether they truly have a passion for entrepreneurship and health and wellness or they're just in it to make a quick buck. Uh, and then the third one, which is always the toughest, is they need to be great leaders to a team of hourly employees. Because if you're a great leader to a team of hourly employees, uh, then you're going to have a team that respects you and, and doesn't steal from you. I learned that the hard way. And, and shows up on time, and you're going to have a customer base that comes back because they've built the relationship with not just Freshy, but you know Cam, the owner of the store. Um, that third part, you know, just because you manage a team of, of accountants with you know with MBAs, doesn't necessarily mean you would be a good uh, manager of nine-dollar employees. And so that's always the toughest, and that's where we either get it right or get it wrong. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My company specializes in the facilitation of soft skill solutions in a proactive environment. And we were one stop. <laughs> Just messing with you. <laughs> but what do you do? What do you do? How do you train people who are coming to you in the next gen den to not sound like that? Um, that's my first question. And the second question is, I'm the author of a book called Step Into the Spotlight. How do I get this book in the hands of people who want to be where you are, who want to step into the spotlight. So how do you, how do, with, in terms of pitching, how do you advise people sound better than reading from a script, I think is the question. Oh, I see. Oh, was that, was that like That's an act, the first That's a question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that <laughs> yeah. was good. Thank you. <laughs> I feel no, that. because a lot of people, a lot of people get an opportunity to be on a show like yours and they sound like that, right? They have four seconds, right? So. You know, I've gotten it in the hands of Paula Abdul. I got it in the hands of a lot of people in the U.S. In Canada, it's so much harder to get a book like this, Step Into the Spotlight, into the hands of people who need it. How would I get it to uh, people who are going to be auditioning for your show and for the Dragon's Den show? Wow, that's a good question. I mean, have you, how many hands have you got it in now? How many what? How many hands have you already got it into? Thousands and thousands. I so mean, I, I speak in places with Arlene Dickinson. I spoke with Brett Wilson. Um, but, but, the younger people is a whole different story. Hmm. Yeah. I see. That's interesting. Um, you know what? I have a good idea. Why don't I get one in the hands of you? Right? Why don't I, why don't I read the first page to the, to the group? <laughs> and see if it puts them to sleep or if it gets them energized. Just imagine what you can do if you get on the web, the webisode. <laughs> this is what you get in real life. So this is my favorite book, you guys. This is really, um, <laughs> you can buy this uh, online. 10% of the pro proceeds go to Freshies, uh, charitable. Yeah, we didn't talk about charity, but we can. <laughs> I'm thinking of making this book available in a plain brown wrapper, or maybe giving it a fake book jacket with the title, Migratory patterns of birds. Because truth be known, most people would rather be caught buying a porno flick than a book like this. <laughs> and it gets better. I'm actually going to save it. Can I keep this? You can absolutely keep it. It's, right. it's endorsed by some of the top business authors in the US. But again, they're speaking to my generation. And I'd like to get in the hands of your generation. 
Well, this is pretty memorable. I'm sure you'll have some sales from this. Thank you very much. My name is Sufit for when you're ready to get noticed. I think we'll go to this, this hey. microphone over here. This lady's been waiting. Hey. Hello. My name's Allison Smith. Um, I started my first business about two and a half years ago. Uh, this is not a question about that, though. That was just an introduction. Um, when you started your franchise model and you spoke of your yellow brick road that you have the franchisees follow, was that something that you developed yourself or did you work with restaurant consultants and business consultants to come up with that? That's a great question. So when, when, when we started franchising, uh, we, probably, we probably weren't deserving of, we had, we had no yellow brick road or play, playbook. We only built that over the years of learning what's worked and what's failed. And so in the early days, it was way less follow our pattern. It was more, oh, this sounds interesting. We're willing to let you try it. Um, and increasingly, as we've built more confidence in our own business and our own team, we've said, no, we, we actually are pretty sure that this is the right way and this is the way it should be. Uh, not, not discounting the fact that we still love finding the next Egg McMuffin or the next you know, Happy Meal. Um, so, so for us, it's like we just, it's just a collaboration over years and years of putting documents together, tweaking them uh, to then what becomes what's very, you know, one very thick operations uh, master manual. And who was the first person, well, not by their name, but maybe by um, title that you hired to work in more of a corporate setting as opposed to um, like as an hourly employee? Um, I hired a... Uh, I hired and paid way too much money to a COO who lasted six months. Um, I then hired and paid way too much money to a CFO who lasted uh, about 12 months, uh, and then went on to my second COO, which lasted another two years, and then that ended. And then we got, and then we got better at understanding the right culture. Um, so it was, a lot of, it was a lot of bad hires in the early days that, that actually, uh, that actually, that, that the culture concept, the, the culture became a, a culture that was getting killed as opposed to a killer culture. Um, so I, got, I made some really, really bad hiring decisions early on. Um, fortunately, it didn't, didn't cripple us, but certainly taught us a lot of lessons about the right corporate culture to be building. I think just to um, have you expand on that, just have him expand on that a little bit, I think um, that's really interesting. Like, it, like what I'm taking from that is that you felt that you were in a position where you needed the expertise of these people, um, and it turned out that maybe the vision that you had wasn't something that they could relate to, or, or wasn't something that they maybe agreed with you on. Like, what? Maybe if you can just quickly expand on what was uh, inappropriate about these executive level hires that you made that was fixed when you got it right? Well, I just think what I was doing was I was hiring restaurant executives who had worked for um, you know, sort of old school, old way of doing thing restaurant brands, uh, which came with certainly a clear skill set, but, but not a vision to, to do something you know, really different in the restaurant uh, world. Um, and, so, and so I think that's maybe where there was a disconnect. OK, great. Okay. Um, over here. Yeah, my name is Barry Whitkin, and I'm the organizer of Startup Toronto, which is a supporter of Startup Canada. My question is, when you decided to do franchises, um, were you concerned that some of the laws of franchising in different areas of the world uh, were very complicated and difficult to sort of get through? Franchise, the franchise agreements are, um, I think they're like 180 pages. So it, it, it's, it's very legal and very nuanced. Um, but that's to protect the small business owner, and that's to protect the brand. Um, and, and ultimately, the franchising is very vanilla. The documents are very consistent across all the different brands. Um, and so we made the investment. I mean, we just we made the investment from knowing that we wanted to be in multiple countries, and it ultimately it cost us a little bit more money, uh, but ultimately it's paid off by by going more mass. So I guess my second question regarding that is: was the um, 
the laws of each country was that difficult to traverse because you had to change your franchising agreements accordingly. I mean, so no, the franchise agreements were fine, but what's interesting is by picking local franchise partners, they understood local laws. I'm not necessarily around franchising per se, but around business owning. Uh, you know, there's certain laws in the Middle East uh, which have a certain structure uh, rule, and there's certain laws in South America. And so having local partners on the ground who grew up in those markets, who've done commerce in those markets, uh, it for sure is the only way that we were able to and afforded the opportunity to go over there as early as we've gone. Great. Okay, okay, thank you. I think we'll go to the center again. Hi, my name is uh, Rafael Roche. Speak right into the mic, right in there, yeah. Maybe if I lift it. Yeah, go for it. Hi. Hi, my name is Rafael Roche. Um, I've been trying to start my business for three years now. Uh, so my question is, what is your biggest failure and how did you deal with it? Why is it taking you three years to start your business? I got stuck with a bad co-packer. What's the product? Uh, it's a natural beverage based on flaxseed. Flaxseed? Flaxseed, Flaxseed yeah. based beverage? Yeah. Interesting. It's actually so, I had a different product in mind and when I started making this at home, my friends were just like, have you made more, have you made more? And every time they came, they would want me to have made more. So I thought, well, this could be something that works and it's really healthy. It's, you've been to South America, so you've probably uh, had a variant of it and it's good for you, it tastes good and it's, it has a very interesting texture to it. And so I went through the government channels and I said, well, how can I get this done without turning you know, my shoebox apartment into a full-blown kitchen? And so I saw the co-packer model. I went through a list that I was given and I, I tried to do my due diligence. Um, how, many, how many shelves are you on right now? I haven't been able to start. So, so there's, a, there's hundreds of beverage companies in the world, right? Thousands probably. And you have this incredible idea from the sounds of it, but you haven't executed. And if you go to my, my, one of my guiding principles, talk is cheap, execution sets you apart. So you're sitting with this brilliant idea which you just shared with uh, several hundred people and somebody in this room might execute better than you. So I, my recommendation is stop talking about it, start executing on it. So what was your biggest failure and how did you deal with it? <laughs> you see how I avoided my biggest yeah. failure by focusing on I your just biggest failure? I know how to do it. Um, no, I mean, look, it, my biggest failure is, uh, my, biggest, my biggest failures have, I've never thought of them as failures because when my co-packer, you know, dropped me, I found another one the next morning and said, screw that, I'm not, that's not going to let me, respectfully, that's not going to keep me from getting to the next stage of my business plan. Thank you. You. Think, about how many, think about how many more people you could be helping live healthier with this interesting flax drink which I'm sure is delicious. Yeah, it is. <laughs> right. You should come visit our test kitchen next week. We'll probably be selling it by then. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Back over to the left here, please. Morning. Um, my name's Dawn Chapman. If you could I'm... right into the mic. Morning. Great. My Good. name's Dawn Chapman. I own Lazy Daisy's Cafe in Little India, and um, we base our cafe on naturally raised, locally sourced food drug and hormone free ethically raised. So we have a lot of high, co sorry, high costs associated with that. Also our team's really important in terms of how we invest in them, you know, we're not minimum wage employee, employer. Um, and so therefore I totally get what you're saying when you look at that month end and you're like, wow, we've been busy every day, everything's going really well, but why are we here and I wanna be there? So what advice would you give about how to manage those extraordinary costs but still manage to put out you know, the product that you want to and stay to your, true to your ethics? That's, I mean, it's such a great question, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna answer that. But by show of hands, how many people have worked in the restaurant business in this room? Um. So everybody who's, who's worked in this business knows that it is one of the hardest businesses in, the indus in any industry to make money at. Mm -hmm. it's, it's called a penny business, right? It's a penny business where your pennies add up uh, mm -hmm. to hopefully lots or, and sometimes not very much. Mm -hmm. uh, 
minimum wages go up every few years. I've never signed a lease where the rent's gone down over the term of the lease. It always goes up. Yeah. Um, competition, you can't, right? I could open an organic restaurant right next to you. So those are all tough things. Um, and, and truly, I mean, it is a difficult model. You want to, Starbucks, Starbucks, for example, pays higher employee wages because coffee beans is like the lowest food cost item in the world. So they can charge, they're making so much money on their coffee that they can actually redeploy some of that profit into labor. And so they're then taking staff that we want to hire, but our fresh produce is expensive, right? Fresh mm -hmm. produce costs more than uh, noodles and costs more than pizza dough and costs more than you know, uh, uh, bread, right? Yeah. So it is a really tough business. And, and I take comfort in that fact, actually, because if you can figure out the right business model for your model, mm -hmm. um, as we have for ours, even though there's no barriers to entry and anybody can come and compete and trade on our business, and I, and I, I know, and I've seen it time and time again, that they probably won't get it right. Just like for the first several years of my business, I didn't get it right. And it only took a certain scale of our business and lots of testing and learning and playing with the model to figure out how to make money with it. Um, so I would just say take comfort in that. Take comfort that competition is, is fierce, but it's really hard to make money at it. So if you can navigate the right model for your business. When you say model, this, I don't have, a, I have an English degree so from Western. So I'm like, I didn't have the business degree. So when you say choose the right business model, I'm sort of thinking of like more specific, something more, a little more specific. Did you need to become a franchiser in order to start making money for real? Many, many of our franchise partners join us. I'd say at least 25% have joined us because they decided they were going to open up a healthy fast food company in their respective city and doing research, they stumbled upon Freshy, right? When they were looking for other things out there. And what they ultimately decided was it was worth paying us 6% royalty on our sales than the, than the same questions you're asking now, which is how many years is it going to take me or how many months is it going to take me to figure out the price point of my menu, where I should, where I should source my kale to get the best cost. Um, what type of employee do I need to employ and how many hours do I need to give them to get the most out of them so that I can actually make money. Mm -hmm. So it, there's only three costs in the restaurant business that matter. Food costs, labor costs, and rent. Those are the only three. So yeah. those three things have to add up to something less than 100 and you're making <laughs> money, right? Yeah. Okay. So just Super. make sure those three things add up to less than 100. Thanks think, very much. Oh, we have one, one more question. Um, so we can go to the middle here. Wow, that's a spot. Um, my name is Nigel Corneal. I'm a service business owner. And I've recently moved into the franchise, well, a franchise type model to grow the business. I'm curious as to how you came upon your franchise fee, how you established that. And I'm wondering about the difference in terms of profitability between the franchise fee and your royalties. And if there's been a change between your first franchise in terms of how you use the fee you collected and now? Yeah. Um, so the first, the first franchise we ever sold before we had ever sold another franchise uh, was in Chicago. And, uh, and the franchise partner paid us uh, $380,000 to buy the rights to a certain market within Chicago. Um, and we sold the deal at full price. And so my, my rule of thumb with my partners is I will never treat a partner differently than I treat another partner. And so one thing I am is consistent and fair. And you're never going to find a better deal than with, you know, I'm never going to give you a better deal than I gave anybody else. I'm never going to give anybody else a better deal than I'm going to give you. And so our business is very vanilla. Uh, it's $30,000 franchise fee. It's 6% of sales. And that's it. And, um, and so that's, and that's the business. And it's vanilla and that's what everybody pays. And if that doesn't work for their business model or, or their business appetite, course, then yeah. this is not the right business for them. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Really sorry to everyone who didn't get a chance to ask their questions. Are you going to stick around a bit? Or are you going to uh, off? Yeah. I think Matthew has just now said he's going to stick around a little bit. You can try and corner him. Um, so good luck with that. Uh, he's obviously very open to that. A round of applause for our keynote Thanks this so morning. Much. Thank you. That was great. 
Thank you very much, Matthew and uh, Rosemary, for your time today, um, and, and, and Matthew, for your insights into the su uh, food service sector um, and all of the great stories you've shared with us today on how to build and grow your business and all of the various challenges and, uh, and rewards associated with that. Uh, one of the things we did as a, as a thank you for you today, Matthew, is we made a donation uh, to Free the Children, uh, which Freshie has a relationship with. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. And, uh, I think this is, again, a, a great example building on our earlier panel uh, where we talked about the, the value of working with social initiatives that align with your business models. And uh, Freshy works with Free the Children to help nourish and energize children in uh, communities in the developing world and with a real focus on building schools and vegetable, uh, school kitchens and vegetable gardens. So thank you, Matthew, for your work on that. Thank you. And of course, thank you, Rosemary, for your time uh, and uh, the, the Star Business Club for uh, being part of today. And we would encourage everyone to uh, check out the Star Business Club as a, a great network and resource for, uh, for, for small businesses. Uh, thank you to you both.